Good evening, folks. Tonight we're going to be talking about a quote that Jesus made in 2 Corinthians 12, verses 9. When Paul addressed Jesus, Jesus made a statement and said, My grace is sufficient for you. I'd like for us to contextualize this statement that Jesus made so we have a better understanding of Jesus' teachings and his actions. And why did Paul ask the Lord to take away the thorn that was in his flesh? In a way, we all have a thorn in our flesh of sorts. It could be healing, it could be psychological, it could be emotional, it could be anything. We all have a thorn in our side. So tonight I want us to get a better understanding of grace. And if we have a, a broader understanding of the narrative of Jesus Christ's teachings, we can apply and appropriate my grace is sufficient for you. So let's explore grace. Defining grace means unmerited favor, kindness, mercy that's bestowed on mankind by God. Grace in a, a Christian theology, um, a central concept emphasizing God's love and forgiveness despite human sinfulness. The significance of the statement my grace is sufficient for you. We got to look at the background of the statement to get a better understanding. So the Apostle Paul's discussions with his thorn in my flesh and his plea to God for it to be removed. Jesus' response to Paul's plea is my grace is sufficient for you. What are the implications of Jesus' response? The emphasis on reliance on divine grace rather than human strength. So let's get a better understanding. We got to understand how that has an implication. So if I go to the Lord and say, Lord, I have a thorn in my side. Won't you please remove it? And the Lord would say then to me, my grace is sufficient for you. How would I feel? How did Paul react? How did Paul feel? And I think for us at this stage in our lives, having studied the Bible, it's not for us to rip apart the statement, but it's it's more aligned for us to be able to get our understanding of why Jesus made the statement. The acknowledgement of human weakness and the need for dependence on God Assurance of God's provision and sufficiency in all our circumstances. Now, if we look at each of those points, we know we need to know that we are assured in God's word that his provision for us will always be there and the sufficiency in our daily lives, whether it be healing, whether it be a job, whether it be health, um, would it be our relationships with our families, with our spouses, with our children, and in a broader sense with, sense with the people around us. But I think if we look at this with a, with a, with a, with a, in a different uh, um, aspect, it's the acknowledgement of human weakness and our need to be dependent on God. So if I have a weakness or a sickness or whatever the case might be, I can learn from this passage of scripture where Jesus says, my grace is sufficient for you. It means I need to rely on Jesus Christ, irrespective of what my thorn in my side is. So we need to look at the lesson that we can, we can draw from this. Trusting in God's provision and not in our own or take pity upon ourselves, learning to rely on God's grace in times of difficulty and weakness. Each one of us, each human being on this planet, and especially God's children, we go through 
difficult times. We go through times of weakness where we where we berate ourselves and say, you silly man, you silly woman, why did you do that? Why did you react like that? And Romans, Romans 8 verse 1 says, there is therefore, therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We must remember we are never perfect. We can never be perfect. So humility and surrender to God, recognizing our limitations and submitting to God's will. If we are in a certain state that we are in, whether we are sick with disease or whatever the case might be, or whether we have a certain personality type or a personality disorder, or we have one leg shorter than the other, or we are just different, that should not detract us from total reliance on God and his word. We need to redefine success in God's word, shifting our focus from worldly achievements to spiritual growth and dependence on God. Not so long ago, we did a teaching on what is success. Success means different things to different people in a different walk of life. Success to one person means something totally radically different to another person's success. So, our worldly achievements really mean nothing because it's a, it's, it's a temporary state. Us being born again and in a spiritual realm, we have eternal life in Christ Jesus. We live forever in Christ. That's achievement. That's success. So what I'd like for us to do is to have a look at this as an application in our daily lives, meaning we, we cultivate a mindset of humility and dependence on God, where our mindset's not about what people think of me or what I look like or what kind of clothes I should wear, uh, what the brand is on my shoes or my jeans or my shirt or, my, or anything that I wear. And that's pretty difficult today because everything in the world is branded. I don't think you can really find anything that's unbranded without the logos on everything. But our mindset of humility must be, that doesn't define me. Many people are so steeped in debt because they have to have the right clothes with a brand name. They have to drive the right car with a brand name. They have to live in a certain area with a brand, the name, the area, because everything that they wear and are seen with defines them but that's not true the bible says that's not true we are defined by our character in christ jesus the bible says that they will know you are mine by your love for one another you see it's all about love it's all about obedience to god it's not about the, the brand names but it's our mindset the change of our mindset. We need to be totally dependent on God, not on ourselves. Finding strength and resilience through reliance on God's grace. There are many instances that I can quote. Um, our reliance on God has to be 100%, not partial. It's difficult for a human being. It depends on your background. It depends on how you were raised. It depends on where you were raised. But we need to dig deep in our hearts and find that strength to rely on God and his grace. Remember, it's not about us. It's about Jesus. It's about his grace that is sufficient for us. It's by his grace we are saved. We've done nothing. We deserve hell, but his grace defines us. Letting go of perfectionism and embracing God's sufficiency in all circumstances. I used to be a perfectionist, and sometimes I still battle. If something's not square, I'll move it till it's square. I'll fix this, fix that, make it look new if I can. 
sometimes it's not a not a bad thing, but sometimes it's not a good thing, <laughs> because I find myself in a in in a in a situation where I want to make it must be perfect. Everything must be square. Everything must have its own place. Must be clean. It must be like this. That's craziness, folks. I've been there, <laughs> and you might as well say, "Me too." <laughs> And we've got to look at extending grace to others, reflecting God's mercy and compassion in our interactions with other people. Um, for us as believers, firstly, we need to be able to interact in a godly manner with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, we need to be able to act in God's manner to the unsaved. But we also need to show mercy on those because God showed mercy to us. However, on those that say they are righteous but are unrighteous in their actions and their deeds, we need to expose them because they don't wear the true brand name of Christ. We are called Christians because Christ Christians. So when people say they are Christians but are not and deny the power of God. Those aren't Christians. Those are deceivers. Reiterating the profound significance of Jesus Christ's statement, my grace is sufficient for you. It encourages listeners and encourages people, family and friends to embrace the transformative power of God's grace in our lives as well as their lives. The thing we've got to understand is we represent Jesus on this planet. We need to be ambassadors for Christ. We are the ones that need to be the Bible to others. And sometimes we don't always have to open our mouths, but it's the way we conduct ourselves that will tell people that we are born-again believers. I think the most important thing for you and me to understand is that by, by God's grace we are saved. Okay. When when Jesus said to Paul, My grace is sufficient for you, it meant that Paul, no matter what's wrong with you, you are perfect in my grace. And tonight I want to say to you that you are perfect in God's grace. My grace is sufficient for you. It's not about who we are, what we think we are, where we come from, where we live. But by his grace, we are saved. Our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life because we are born again. It's by his grace. And his grace is sufficient for you and for me. Closing with a reflection on or prayer, the emphasis on gratitude for God's abundance, grace and provision in our lives. Many of us are blessed abundantly in, in every sphere of our lives. Maybe some of us are not blessed in this particular sphere or that particular sphere, but we are all blessed. We all have a gift. We all have a talent that God has given us. That's his grace. And we've got to use our talent through his grace to bring him glory. Our reference tonight is 2 Corinthians 12, 7, 9, and um, there are various theological texts, obviously, and commentaries on the concept of grace and teachings in Jesus Christ. And you'll find that in, in, in your Bible. If you study your Bible, you'll see what God's grace is. John 3, 16, God's grace. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but ever, have everlasting life. That's grace. John 3, 3, when Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born again before you can see the kingdom of God. God's grace. When Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man comes unto the Father except through me. God's grace. Because we cannot get to heaven through it without Jesus Christ. Narrow is the gate and few the find that gate that led to eternal life. God's grace. Wide is the road and many thereupon that lead to death and destruction. God's grace. 
you, you, you and me, we have a choice, a decision to make in our lives. We choose God's grace or we shun God's grace. We accept salvation and live in it to the full. Or we shun God's grace and we live our lives in the world to the fullness thereof. But there are consequences, eternal consequences. Dependence on divine, on divine grace is this statement underscores the fundamental Christian belief in the sufficiency of God's grace for all aspects of life. We are blessed abundantly in everything that we do. God says whatever we set our hands to do will prosper if we trust in him, rely and depend on him. It is important that we can, we can grasp God's grace. The Christian belief in the sufficiency of God's grace, grace teaches us believers, our born-again believers, <clears throat> to rely not only on our own strength or abilities, but on God's grace. This reliance fosters humility and trust in God's wisdom and his provision. God says we must humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift us up by his grace. Overcoming human weakness by God's grace. By acknowledging that his grace is sufficient for us, Jesus acknowledges the reality of the human weaknesses and frailty. Remember, Jesus knows we live in a fallen world. We live in an evil, wicked world right now. This reassures believers that we need not to be overwhelmed by our shortcomings and our limitations. We all have them. I don't care who you are or what you say. We all have those, believe me. Instead, we can find strength and resilience in God's grace, which transcends human imperfection. We can never be perfect. God says there's no man perfect. And there's no man without sin. Whoever says... He has no sin, is a lie, and the truth of the Father is not found in him. See, God's grace means more to us as believers than anything else in the world. Our true mindset must be we live by God's grace. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. Freedom of self-reliance. In a world that often glorifies self-sufficiency, we see that on television, social media, Every media platform there is, it's about independence. Me, myself, and I, look how great I am. Look at what I've, I have achieved. Look what I can achieve. Look where I am. Look what I'm, look at my life. And that's seen on every social media platform, people self-elevation. But sometimes that self-reliance is, is a facade. It's people pretending to be who, who they wish to be or want to be psychologically and emotionally these people have a problem because they wish to be somebody else because they are not satisfied with who they are simply because they haven't come to terms with the grace of Jesus Christ once you meet Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior we get to know who we are in Christ and we learn about God's grace because we realized we were once hellbound and now we are heaven bound because of God's grace. Because he died on the cross for us so that we could have the gift of eternal life. Jesus' statement challenges this mindset of independence and self-sufficiency. Um, it helps us to let go of this pressure of having it all together. Living our life, man, I've, I'm, I'm okay, I'm cool, don't worry about me. But in the meantime, emotionally, psychologically, physically, mentally, you messed up because you're trying to maintain this facade to impress the people around you. You're not the real person. And that is something that we as born again, born again believers have this grace, this I'm content with who I am in and out of season. No matter where I find myself, I am 
always content. Um, when we surrender our lives to Jesus, it's a, pro a profound sense of freedom um, and also gives us peace and individual release of this burden of trying to control every aspect of our lives. We try and control these various aspects, but we can't. You wake up one morning and boom, all this has happened. Where did this come from? How did this happen? Why did it happen to me? Why, 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 why? And we try and control everything. It's impossible for us to do that. But when you're in Christ and these trials come your way and, and all the challenges, we go on our knees and we say, Lord, thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for giving me the strength and the courage to overcome these challenges. Teach me what to do. Show me how. And when we humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, he will help us. He will guide us. He will give us that strength to go through the battle. Just remember, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were thrown into fire, okay, a chamber of fire because they didn't obey the king's commands. They came out alive. They didn't even smell like smoke. All right, there's a lesson when we believe and trust emphatically in the total truth. We know we are in Christ. We know we can rely on Jesus to get us through our tests and trials. Embracing divine power is Jesus' highlights the paradoxical nature of divine power manifesting through human weakness. Being there, done that. You go through things in your life. But his divine power carries us. It lifts us up. The Bible says that he takes our yoke. He takes our burdens and he helps us to walk through it. When there's a fight to be fought, we have to walk through it. We have to fight that fight. But we know that Christ is with us. And we come through the other side knowing, wow, okay, I, I lived through that. It made me feel good. Why? Because Jesus was with me. In the absence of Christ, most people take their own lives. <clears throat> Excuse me, most people can't cope. Most people just give up. They have no hope whatsoever. And that's the thing. Reliance on divine power. Rather than viewing weakness as a hindrance, believers are invited to see it as an opportunity for God's power to be displayed. Many a time when you go through tests and trials in your life and God changes things in your life and you say, Lord, why? And you rebuke Satan <clears throat> and, and all the attack from, from the evil one. But sometimes these things happen for a reason. Romans 8.28 says, all things happen for the good to those who trust in God and accord according to his purpose. So we know that things happen in our lives for a reason, and it's always a good reason. And so we have to go through the waters. We have to swim to get to the other side. It doesn't mean you supernaturally go into the other side. There's no test. There's no trial. There's no victory if there's no battle. So we have to rely on God's grace to carry us through once again, it's the mindset. The transformative perspective, ultimately the statement, my grace is sufficient for you, offers transformative perspective on life's challenges and trials. It invites believers to view difficulties not as insurmountable obstacles, but as opportunities, as an opportunity for God's grace to abound in our lives. If we open ourselves up and say, Lord, I'm going through a torrid time right now. I need your grace. I need your help. I need you to walk with me. And you know what? God will help us. Each one of us have been through that from a little child to where we are right now. We have all experienced God's help in some form or fashion. 
when Peter got out of the boat and he, and he said to Jesus, can I come to you? Jesus said, yes. And when he walked on the water, he realized, hey, I'm doing a divine thing. I'm walking on water. No man has walked on water. And when he took his eyes off Jesus, he began to sink and Jesus reached out and grabbed him by his hand. Once again, when we take our eyes off Jesus, our mindset changes. When we look at the problems around us, instead of the solution to the problem, God's grace will be with us because we are Christians. We rely on him. Let's not take our eyes off Jesus. Let's not take our eyes off the grace that he's given us. So in summary, the importance of Jesus Christ's statement lies in its profound reassurance of God's grace as sufficient for all aspects of life. It challenges believers to shift their focus from self-reliance to dependence on God, embracing human weakness as an opportunity for divine power to be made perfect. And the deeper understanding that God's unconditional love and provision for us. When we say, Lord, I don't know what I'm going to do. Do I take this job or that job? Do I go down this road or do I go down that road? Generally, we have the Holy Spirit in us that helps us. That still voice within us. And I've experienced that on numerous occasions. Whereas I suddenly go another road that I never ever drive on. And I just go. It's like, okay, well, why are you going this way, George? Well, I don't know, I'm just going this way. There are always things that happen in our lives that we need to trust God with. And sometimes we have to be obedient to him. The specific ailment or challenge that Paul refers to his thorn in the flesh is not explicitly stated in the Bible. The phrase is found in 2 Corinthians 12, 7, and as we alluded to earlier, where Paul writes, or because of these surpassing great revelations, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. What a powerful passage that Paul gives us. So this language suggests that the thorn in the flesh was a source of physical or emotional suffering from Paul, which he attributes to being a messenger of Satan. Despite Paul's three pleads to the Lord for its removal, Jesus responds with that statement, my grace is sufficient for you. And I think for us, we need to understand no matter where we are, no matter what thorn we have in our side, no matter who we think gave it to us, always remember when we are weak, we are strong because it's God's grace that strengthens us. I love that. I love that. Um, that, that last section where it says, that is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness in insults, in hardships and persecutions and in difficulty. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I'd like to end on that tonight because I think it's beautiful for us to know that when I am weak, I am strong because I cast my cares on Jesus. My weakness is on Jesus. And when Jesus strengthens us, we are strong. I hope this, this teaching tonight has, has helped you in a way where you look at yourself and you do some introspection. It's just not its not who I am or what I am. It's about Jesus in me. Remember, 
Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. It is Christ that lives in me. And I in him. John 15 tells us this. And so our mindset must change, as I said earlier. And this week I challenge you to look at the challenges that you're going through with a different lens. Look at it through the eyes of Jesus. Difficult though it may be, but try. Because then we can look at our challenges as, okay, Lord, how are we going to do this? Give me some advice. What do I do? How do I go? We don't have an immediate defeatist attitude. But we have a heart of victorious uh, um, um, ending on, on, on our challenges. We become victorious the moment Jesus is with us. We already have a mindset of victory. God bless you, and I hope that this changes your way of thinking, and I pray that God's grace and mercy is with you always. Good night.